Okay, we are there. Let's begin. Why don't we begin with prayer? Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come here to this place today to be in your word, uh, in worship, and here at Bible study. As we study 2 Thessalonians here today, um, we ask that you would send us your spirit. We ask that you would allow us to, to understand and appreciate these words and appropriate them for our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, we have got 2 Thessalonians 3 today. I did print out all of the sections from chapter 3 that we're going to, or the divisions that I made. They're all printed out there for you on your sheet. But if you would like, uh, you're free to open up to your favorite Bible translation or use the one there you've got on your desk too. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3, this is a, a pretty interesting letter here. When Paul visited the Thessalonians, he was there for a very short amount of time. Uh, probably no more than about a week. He, he had a, a lot of issues there, and he got ran out of the city. Um, but anyways, he left. And not long after, he got a report that there were some interesting things going on in Thessalonica. So he wrote him first Thessalonians. He later got a report that there were still some interesting things going on in Thessalonica. So he wrote them uh, the second letter here. And we're going to look at the last chapter of that second letter here today. And really... Paul is going to address pretty much the same exact issues in this letter that he addressed in 1 Thessalonians. However, his tone is going to be a little bit more different, and we're not necessarily going to see that here today because we don't have time to run through the first letter. But, but he is going to take a little bit of a harsher tone here, and maybe we will see that a little bit as we start to get into it. Um, let's begin. Take a look at the first little introductory question you've got there on the top of your page. Looks like it's going to take it a while to advance. Okay, so consider the first question there. I need to run back real quick and grab coffee and a writing utensil. So, so look at the picture here. You've got one word to summarize or one word to explain what's going on here. What would that word be? And then how does this kind of attitude, where does that spring from? Where does it come from? And how do we deal with that? So please uh, talk it over with people sitting near you. Talk it over with the people sitting in the room. Uh, you don't need to sit here with your mouth shut. Please uh, have at it. I will be right back. What I was thinking, my second cho word choice would be comfortable. <laughs> comfortable. You're too comfortable to do something like when someone tells you to like get up and do a chore. Like when someone tells you like to get up and do something, you're like too comfortable. Okay, so what did we come up with? What word did we have? Lazy. Lazy. Yeah, that's the exact word that I had thought of too. Were there any other words that came up? Lazy. Complacent, okay, okay. Any others? Okay, so right away when and I, I searched laziness on Google and this was the first picture that came up and I thought it was perfect, it really is. What causes laziness? Okay, lack of responsibility. If nobody's gonna expect anything of me, why would I do anything? What else? Lack of motivation. What's the point? What's the purpose of all this? What else causes laziness? Complacency. Complacency, yeah. Well, that's a big deal. Who cares, right? <laughs> Anything else? 
How, how would you fix laziness? Did you get up and do something? Well, let's assume it's not that simple. <laughs> how would you fix laziness? I'd give them some sort of motivation. Okay, there's got to be something to motivate them, right? Any, any other, anything else? Encouragement. Encouragement, sure. Um, you know, this isn't good. Here's a better path. I'm going to be with you and help you out down that path. Good. What else? Any, anything else? No, I think we've pretty much hit all the big ones. Well, the reason why I have this picture up here is because in 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul is really addressing that issue, idleness, people not working, people not doing anything, people not being involved. And there are a couple of reasons why this sprang up here in Thessalonica, why laziness crept in their congregation. Now, it was kind of a cultural thing at, at that time in ancient Greece that Men just didn't really work with their hands. That was a, a female thing. Um, it wasn't dignified or something like that for men to do that kind of stuff. So Paul comes along in his first letter and he tells them, we need to get to work with your hands. You need to do something productive. You can't just sit around and make your wife earn all the money. No, Christianity doesn't work like that. Everybody works. Everybody has their role. They do it. So there's probably a little bit of pushback on their part too. But there was a, a bigger issue in that church. Now, Someone had told them, they, they had received a letter that was allegedly from Paul. It really wasn't from Paul. But someone had told them in that letter that Jesus already came back. He already came back for Judgment Day. So they said, well, we're just going to sit here and wait until he judges us. Now, they, they had a, a pretty big misunderstanding of what Judgment Day is and how that's going to work and what Jesus is going to do. And that led to their idleness. That led to their laziness. And that is really going to be the issue that Paul is going to address here. Um, but these first five verses of chapter three, Paul's not quite going to get into it so hard. He's, he's not really going to hammer on them for their idleness. Instead, he, he's got a few words that really, I think, close out the last chapter, chapter two. Now, let's consider what chapter two is about. That Second Thessalonians 2 is really all about the Antichrist, um, the, the one who comes and sets himself up in Christ's place. And Paul was telling him, no, Jesus is not going to come back until the Antichrist is revealed, until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And until that happens... Okay, thank you, Caleb. So, explain, why are those verses, what, what in those five verses there would make a, a fitting close for the stuff that Paul had talked about in chapter two? What, why is this such a good way to end the Antichrist topic? He encourages them and motivates them. Okay. In faith. Yeah, stay in your faith. There's lots of encouragement, lots of motivation there. What else? What is he asking them to pray for? Look at uh, verses one and two. What are Paul's prayer requests? Uh, more and more, to spread the word more rapidly so that more people can know about Jesus. Yeah, why, why would he ask that? Why would he want them to be praying for that specifically? That's for everybody. You know, you know 
He's someone that comes into God's church and leads people astray from God's word. So it, it makes sense that Paul is going to ask, well, let our ministries be effective. Pray for us that uh, we won't be harmed in any way. What, what else do you see in here? Fitting close to the section on the Antichrist. And like, um, that they will all like, because it's all it's not true that all this anymore stuff is not true. It's, and just this day has not happened. So like, he's encouraging them that just trusting God and know all like, what we're over and stuff that we no longer have to deal with all the rumors and stuff. Okay, yeah, putting putting some of those rumors to bed. Good, good. Anything else you see it in here? And I, I would maybe just uh, highlight to verse five. Now look at that. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. That's a prayer, isn't it? He, he's praying that God would strengthen them. He's praying that God would direct them towards heavenly things, that God would keep them strong, that, that God would encourage them with Christ's perseverance. Um, that's Pastor Paul praying this. That's Pastor Paul praying for his people. Um, and just so you guys know, I'm, I'm sure you already probably do know this, but your pastors are praying for you too. Your, your, your pastors are saying these kind of prayers for you because they... They care about you. They, they really do. Your, your pastors and your vicars, they, they don't want unchristian forces to attack you. They don't want unchristian forces to assault you. So, so they're praying the same things for you guys that Paul was praying here for these Thessalonians. Let's look at that next question there. List several anti-Christian forces at work in our world today. Describe the encouragements you find in these verses as you live amongst these folks. So let's take the first part of that question first. Several anti-Christian forces at work in our world today. Sure, yeah, we've got media, the entertainment industry, a lot of values that wouldn't align with scripture there. Others. Okay, yeah, so, and you know, they, they may be leading people astray, it may be purposeful, it may be um, out of ignorance, but yeah, I mean, there are people who are being led astray. Others? Social media. Okay, social media. What were you thinking on the social media? No, people were sharing not so nice things. Yeah. Just a, another really easy, really convenient way to get your hurtful and, and hateful thoughts about other people out there. Other anti-Christian forces in our world? The government. The government? It certainly can be, right? Um, you know, it, it hasn't been out of the news too long ago that people want to, you know, I, I've seen stuff in Texas. They want to censor pastor sermons. They, they want to force... Uh, wedding cake companies to make cakes for weddings that they don't want to make them for others, other anti-Christian forces. Rumors and like, rumors and lies. Rumors and lies from whom? Just like, like, um, rumors and lies about, you know, how like, Christians are evil that you should trust them on um, things like that. Yeah, how much of that, well, Maybe people who haven't been to the university in the last few years wouldn't know, but I, you probably heard that there's a lot of that that happens in the university, right? Um, yeah, you'll, you'll have college professors that are, are going to tell you that the Christians are the hateful ones. They're the ones that are intolerant. They're the ones that are causing pain and suffering in this community and that community. Let's not look overlook some of the uh, obvious ones either. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say obvious, but... Uh, there's a lot of religions that aren't Christianity, right? Um, and every one of them seeks to undermine what Jesus has done, either by saying that there's no triune God, either by saying that um, you gotta you do enough good things and you'll get reincarnated. I mean, it's a cycle that keeps reoccurring until you reach the highest good or, or whatever it may be. Um, 
there are tons and tons of anti-Christian forces in our world. Tons and tons of forces that the devil uses to try and get you. So as you read Paul's words here, what encouragements do you find? Do you personally find as you live amongst these foes? That like, no matter what our times come, like, uh, he states that uh, God will always be with you. Okay, how is that for a reminder, right? It's like God is always with you. Um, even when Satan comes close, even when people who would rather see you deny your faith and then pick up their cause, when that kind of stuff comes close, God is still right there. And we're, we're actually going to talk about that in our sermon a little bit later. So, good thought. Other encouragements you find here? This is more of a personal story, but like we were in we were at Hobby Lobby weeks ago, and there was a gentleman out in the parking lot preaching and singing gospel music, and I was able to share that on Facebook and mm-hmm. able to get a lot of you know encouraging words from others, saying you know like not to deal with this is this is what you don't see in the news or on other social media, like that's really what's happening that you just don't see. Yeah, you know that uh, that that's the. Uh, uh, Good story, good point there, because you know what, it reminds me of what, what was Paul praying for? His prayer was that God would give more people to his church, send more people out into the world to, to share that message, to, to preach and proclaim the, the good news of Jesus. Good. Other encouragements? Well, not to sound like a broken record here, but uh, your pastors are praying for you. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. <laughs> Anything else you want to say here on this point? Um, he states that, you know, the Lord, that the Lord's always, like, faithful and, like, strength and to protect you and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's, like, a main, that's, like, one of the main points. Yeah. Yep, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, a, a thought we don't ever want to forget. And Paul will say that phrase, God is faithful, over and over and over and over again in his letters. Uh, the reason why? Because it's true. It's true, but it, it can be easy for sinful people in a sinful world to forget about that. So Paul keeps giving us that reminder. God is faithful. He's not going to stop doing what he said he's going to do. So when he says uh, God is going to give you strength, God is going to keep you steadfast, it's really going to happen. Yeah, Caleb. I don't know. It was sort of like, um, it like in the mindset that God is always with you and stuff. It Mm -hmm. reminds me of something that happened not that long ago. Um, we, 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 we were going home from church and we had to stop by and get some gas and the car was into me. So, and, and apparently, like an, an hour and 30 minutes ago, a guy left that same gas station and he left his wallet there. And uh, so mom noticed that I went into the gas station, mom walked in and said, hey, look, there's a wallet and stuff. And the guy comes back and he says, I lost some wallet. So him and mom were like talking and I heard, and he said, oh, I'm a Christian as well. Like, you can even, because mom was wearing the, the, the you know, live generous mm-hmm. God, and he knows that she was a Christian. So they were both talking about how they were Christians and stuff. And it reminded me of the fact that like, his wallet was so perfectly out of the way to where nobody can, you know, notice it or, mm-hmm. so it, it made me think, well, God really is. Yeah, with us. yeah. There's a, a lot of ways that God is with us, and maybe, <laughs> maybe it is just something so simple as your lost wallet wasn't left right out in the middle of the open for anybody to come and steal your stuff. Just the fact it was like, like at first I thought, oh, it was just like you know, like you know, people lose their wallets all the time. Mm-hmm. That's just thing in small places. Yeah. But then he said, that, you know, he's a Christian. I'm like, okay, there's something going on. <laughs> and then when he said that he lived the the wallet's been there for like an hour and 30 minutes. I was like, okay, yeah, God's definitely more. <laughs> yep, good reminders everywhere, right? <laughs> Anything else you want to say here? All right, so let's really get into the meat of chapter three now. Paul is going to address the, the idleness issue 
quite heavily here. Can we get a volunteer to read verses 6 through 13? Anybody want those? Go ahead, Greta. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to teaching, to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are not busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of Okay, thank you, Greta. So as we heard those verses, as you may be scanning through them again, how can you tell from those verses that Laziness is a serious sin, uh, uh, the question there. And in what ways do these verses show how serious the sin of laziness is? We don't eat. Uh, right? Uh, <laughs> how is that for a, a, a rule or an ultimatum or whatever? If you don't want to work, well, then you're not going to eat. Don't expect everybody to just sit and take care of you. Don't, don't expect that you can just mooch off of people. What else? He says, you know, keep away from those who aren't, who are idle. So if they're not doing it, then stay away. Yeah, right. You know, keep away. Okay. Not, not, yeah, I mean, that's almost, in a sense, what he's saying. We'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Paul's going to come and circle back to that issue. But, yeah, uh, keep away from them. Not just uh, don't talk to them or whatever. No, keep away from them. Don't stay away from that influence. Anything else? Well, okay, to that one, you know. What, what does Paul say? How does he open up that thought? Right before he says, keep away from them, in verse 6, what does he say? How does he introduce that command? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's tying this command to Jesus. You know, this is God's will. Um, stay away from idle people. Don't be idle yourselves. Don't let this happen. Don't give the impression that this is okay. What else do you see in here? He, he does use him, the, himself as an example. When, mm -hmm. when I was there, I could have taken the food for free, but I was constantly working yeah. on showing you how to do it so that you don't, I, I didn't just come in and say, I deserve this and teach you. He was doing the work as well. Yeah, he gave them a really good example of it. And now, you know, think about Pastor Paul, right? Our pastors receive paychecks. This is their job. This is what they do for work. Um, Paul addresses the same issue in First Corinthians. He says, well, no, your, your pastor, that's his job. So you should be paying him a salary or compensating for him in some way. And he says that here too, right? Like we could have done that. I, I could have taken a paycheck from you guys, but I didn't do that because I wanted you to have my example. I wanted you to see what hard work looks like. I wanted you to see what it looks like to, to earn a living for yourselves. Yeah, Caleb. It's basically saying like, you know, even if you earn, even if, even though you do good, even though like you earn money from having a job, it's not the fact that you earn, it's basically saying, it's not the fact that you get something in the reward. Don't just do something so you can get a reward. Do something. Do like hard work or something. Because mm -hmm. like being a Christian and doing good things, it's not about getting a reward. It's just the fact that you're being kind and that you're doing work. Yeah. And so you don't have the respect. You don't have to be like, well, you should have. Well, I only did it, so you know I can get something back. That's not the whole point of you know um, doing good things. Good and 
the ways that the Lord told, the Lord told us to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, the, the purpose of having a job isn't necessarily to get money or to get recognition or something like that. No, the, the purpose of having a job is that God doesn't want us to be idle. He's called us to be productive. Um, the, the rewards and, and the compensation is, is just a little bit of icing on top there for, um, you know, carrying out that goal. Anything else you see here? Laziness is a big deal. I think we've pretty much hit them all. Um, let's go back and look at verse 10 there. Look at that rule that Paul gave them. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So analyze that rule there in verse 10. What is Paul saying? What is Paul not saying? Analyze the rule. Okay. Yep, yep. It's uh, uh, you, You've got to work. Stuff's not just going to be handed out. That's what he is saying. Um, what is he not saying, however? Because we, we could definitely read more into this than Paul is saying. I want to make sure we don't do that. He's not saying that you, know, you, that you won't eat if you don't do work. Like, he's not saying that. What do you, like, I'm just, like, he's, he's basically saying, you know, what she said. Like, um, you, do, you basically, like, eating, he's not comparing eating to be, like, you know, starving food and eating food. He's saying that, like, you know, in order to work, in order to get things, you have to work for it. And that's what he's saying. Yep. And that, that's kind of the general principle that Paul is laying down here is um, we're not reliant on everybody, generally speaking. You know, generally speaking, this is how it works. If you want to eat, you've got to go to work so that you can get paid. What is Paul not saying, Aaron? I, I think the key word is the unwilling. Yeah. He's not saying if you don't work, you don't eat. He's saying if you're unwilling. Yes. So which covers yes. the can't work. Yeah. Unwilling is the key word in here. It's an attitude thing, right? There, there are people in our world who can't work. There are people that do need to rely on others to help them out because they just physically can't do it. Or there, there's some reason why they can't work. Um, Unwilling is the key word. This is the attitude of, well, why should I? Why would I when I can just collect a check from the government? Or why would I when someone else is going to be dropping stuff off at my house every week? Whatever it may be, the, the key word there is unwilling. Paul is addressing the attitude of laziness here. Like, um, yeah, go ahead. I think what he's doing is he's, he's not saying that you know, the people who can't work is the, the condition they have. Mm -hmm. He's not saying that they're not willing to do things. He's, he's basically stating that they really can't do things. And he's talking about the people who don't do things and, like, you know, they get a you know, reward or something. He's just, he's talking about, he's really talking about the two differences that mm -hmm. have, like, people who literally can't work or the people that just don't care about work. Yep. And he's focusing more on the people that don't care about working. Exactly. He's addressing the attitude of I don't want to work, not people who, who you know, legit for legitimate reasons can't. And, and we know from Paul's life and letters that he wasn't opposed to charity. I mean, when, when he went to Corinth, not long before he went to Corinth, he was in Jerusalem and there was a terrible famine in Jerusalem. I mean, nobody had food. So Paul made it a point when he would go visit churches and when he would write letters to uh, make sure that you guys have all of this stuff collected. So that way, when I can come, we don't have to worry about anything. It's just there. I can pick it up and take it back to Jerusalem for the people there who have need. We know Paul is, is not opposed in any way to taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. It's, it's, it becomes an issue when it's the, the attitude again. Um, I've got a, a slide here. You don't have this on your sheets, but I, I think it's worth our while to spend a moment talking about it when it comes up. Okay. What about these things? How do these items fit in? For, for those of you who can't see it, this is a electronic food stamp sign. You know, we're accepting that. And, and this one over here is uh, the Teamsters logo, the, the labor union Teamsters. Where do these fit in? What are you thinking? Well, the union Teamsters is an enabler to provide for yourself mm -hmm. in, in regard to work, right? It's, 
an organization that enables people to provide yeah. for themselves. It helps people out. It, yeah. it helps in that space. Um, and, and the other side, it's the EBT, the food stamps. That's more of the charity side of the equation, mm -hmm. helping the people that truly can't help themselves. Yep. Yeah, the, the reason why I bring these up here is uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 has been used as a passage that says we should get rid of this. Um, these things are, have they been abused? Sure. Is that an attitude we need to correct? Of course. Um, but, but these programs, they were never intended to be abused. They, like think about the labor unions. I mean, why, why, why do we have them? Well, because people working 20 hours a day and people were dying every day in those factories. I mean, it, it was not a place where you wanted to be. Um, the, the, the unions, they, they're introduced and, and all of a sudden we're protecting bodies. We're protecting bodies that God gives that aren't necessarily being protected by employers. Um, food stamps, again, same idea. There's people who can't work. There's people who can't earn money so they can't buy food. These programs are, were implemented to help people out. They were implemented with God-pleasing intentions. They're certainly good and, and godly things. And again, they can be abused, and that is an attitude that should be corrected, but not necessarily these things here. Any thoughts, any follow-ups? Okay. Take a look at the next question on your sheet. We're going to jump down to verse 13. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Consider that first question there, or the first item. Put, put that verse into your own words. What is Paul saying here? Never tire of doing good. What's the point? What's the encouragement? Okay, don't get distracted. Um, continue to work hard. Any others? I can even say don't get discouraged by those around you. Because I think he's trying to focus on, we know there are people, because he says it earlier, we know that there are people who are being lazy, mm -hmm. who are being useless. Yep. I think he's directing that towards focus on yourself. Don't get discouraged because you see the others, you know, you just worked for your food. Mm -hmm. And you see the others who didn't work and they're still getting their food. The, the abuse of the EBT. Sure. Don't, don't let the abuse take away from its need and yep. from your doing something. Yeah, uh, both of those really, both answers really capture the essence of what Paul is saying here. Continue to work hard. Don't be discouraged by those who aren't. Now, that's a good transition into the, the second half of the question there. For what reasons might a Christian become tired of doing what is good? Like, you know, they get distracted by people who are um, encouraging, like, you know, they're encouraging sin and stuff like that. Or, you know, not focusing on what God wants you to do. Okay, yeah. Uh, being distracted, being, or, or losing focus on... Or, or rather because of people who are fostering perhaps bad attitudes and actions. That certainly does frustrate people from time to time. Um, the encouragement here, again, would be continue to work hard, right? What else? What other reasons? If you don't see results. If you're not seeing results, yeah, you, you can lose some motivation, can't you? Um, well... What's the point of going to work? I'm still struggling to make ends meet. Any other reasons? You see people that aren't working as hard as you, they're the ones being rewarded, and you just keep being on the side. Yeah, that, that's a big one, too. And, and Aaron, you kind of mentioned that, too. Um, uh, what, what's the point? Other people are doing a lot less than I am, and they're, they're taken care of. In some cases, they might have it better than I do. <laughs> What's the point of going on the way I'm going? I've chosen the wrong path, right? Sometimes it's that struggle when you are doing the right thing, and you are doing the work, and you look at, I, I keep using the EBT as mm -hmm. an example, 
you, you're at the grocery store and you're you're buying hamburger helper because that's what that, that's what you can afford that day. And the person behind you has their EBT card and they've got credit cards. Mm -hmm. You know, and they may have a very good reason for doing that, but on the surface, it's discouraging that. You know, yeah, I, am, I put in time and effort, and the perception is they have it. Like, yeah, you that, don't always know the, the full story. Right, right? but yeah, I mean, that's definitely a discouraging thing. Like you said, you're waiting in line at the grocery store, and I pull my wallet, and oh, man, this is the only cash I have left from my 80 hours I worked last week, and it's got to go to this hamburger helper. And the guy that was right in front of me just swiped his EBT card. Yeah, Caleb. Uh, it's like uh, you can lose motivation for doing good when you know you you're you're doing as hard as you can, like you're doing the work, and somebody else just takes the credit for what you really worked hard on. Yeah, you just get kind of pushed to the side. People are blowing you off, pretending like you you know you didn't contribute or you didn't do enough, or whatever. Yeah. Any others? Well, we've certainly highlighted a lot of very real uh, concerns and worries that people have, a lot of very real things that probably do at times discourage us. But, but take Paul's uh, encouragement here to heart. Never tire of doing what is good. Um, continue to work hard. Continue to serve God. Continue to be the people that he has called you to be. Let's take a look at verses 14 and 15 now. Verses 14 and 15 are still... They're still connected to verses 6 through 13 here, but I wanted to break them off because Paul is going to come down a little bit harsher now on those who are idle. And really, he is going to be calling for church discipline on those who are idle. Let's take a look at 14 and 15. Would anybody like to read 14 and 15 for us? Go ahead. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed, yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Okay, so we're circling back to the, the uh, idea of keep away, shunning them. Why, why do we do this? What's the goal? What, what are the intentions here? Um, so as we do that, consider the next question. What lessons do these verses teach about church discipline? And in just a moment, I've, I've got another slide for us to look at. But before... There. What do you see in these verses right here about church discipline? So we would be talking about excommunication here ultimately. Um, but but anyways, what do you see? Kind of associate yourself with being around people that work hard versus somebody that's not. Okay, so it, it, the one of the goals or purposes in this is so that we ourselves aren't led astray, so that we ourselves aren't uh, don't go down this path. That's one of the reasons why I would carry out church discipline. And it certainly comes out here, you know, take special note of these people. Uh, stay away. What else? Treat like the end of the culture. Okay, that's, that's going to be a key thought here, especially then. Why, why would we disassociate with people? Well, it's because we care about them and, and we don't want to give them the impression that this unrepentant sin is okay. So there's a motivation for our own souls, and there's a motivation for the, the sinning party's soul as well. Anything else you see here? I, I think it takes it a step that we don't regard them as an enemy. You're, you're keeping them away and, and shunning them, not as a final, okay, we're done with you forever. It's a, we're doing this short term yeah. to show you that you're wrong and bring you back. Yeah, so it, exactly. If, if an individual were to be excommunicated, the congregation doesn't treat this as a ha-ha, gotcha. That's, that's not what this is about. Um, it's about showing people how serious sin is. It's, it's about showing people that those who don't repent of their sin are outside of the kingdom of God. You're not a member of the church. You're, you will be in hell if you die. And, and of course, we don't want people that we care about, deeply care about, in hell. So we, we show them this is you know not uh, this is a big deal. Reminds, and, yeah, Caleb, go ahead. It reminds me of the keys, like the lock, the, the locking and the binding. Yep, the, the, this is exactly what we're talking about here. The the use of the keys, loosening and binding. Good. You uh, must have learned that in catechism class. 
<laughs> he must have had a good teacher. I know it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I we can't remember when you can. Anything else here? Any other lessons? Uh, one that I maybe would have come out in a way, Paul doesn't specifically address it here, but I think it's worth considering too, is uh, who gets excommunicated? Well, it's anybody who is unrepentant of their sin. Um, any Christian who doesn't care, doesn't think they need forgiveness. Now, I bring that up uh, just because what, what are we dealing with here specifically is laziness. Um, it's a, a sin that we maybe would think of a little more lightly than something like murder or robbery or rape. Some sins are worse than others, right? Well, in a sense, sure, but, but in God's eyes, I mean, sin is sin, whether you're killing someone or whether you don't want to go to work. Um, so the, the idea here is that it, it doesn't matter the, the magnitude of the sin. If, if there's sin that's not repented for, um, th that individual is outside the church, treat them accordingly is essentially what Paul would say here. Now, there's one final point here that I want us to consider about church discipline. Um, when we get there, we'll get there. Okay, so we have a few pastors here. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Elsewhere, he said, we urge you, brothers, to warn those who are idle. And then we just read it here. We command you, brothers, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. What do you notice about these passages here? Look specifically at the references. So the first one is from, Acts. it's from the book of Acts. So the book of Acts, the second half of Acts is relating Paul's journey. So we've got Paul there visiting with these people, teaching these people. How about the next one, reference there? He's addressing the believers in that city. Yep, so church. after he's visited them and he gets a report that there's some stuff going on, he writes a letter. How about this last one here? It's from 2 Thessalonians, right? So there's another letter. He's addressing these issues. So can anybody read my mind? What am I going for here? What's the point? They all stay the same Yep, he's addressing the same issue multiple times, right? Uh, the, the point here that we would take away from this is patience, persistence. Um, excommunication is not necessarily a you know, one or two day kind of thing. Um, again, we're dealing with a brother. We're dealing about someone with, for whom we care a lot, tremendously. So we, we take time. This takes a while to determine. It takes a while to get to this point that... And that's exactly what Paul did here. He visited them once. He taught them, corrected them. They didn't learn from it. He wrote them another letter. Paul was patient. Paul was persistent. Which brings us into our next question. There, evaluate that statement. Church discipline requires firmness and patience. Love for a sinning brother will make both easy to come by. Any thoughts? No, but necessarily the second because ultimately we are human, so we may not always be patient. Yeah, um, we are going to be sinful people. We are, so um, we're not always going to carry this out perfectly, right? Just like anything else we do, we're, we're not going to be perfect at it. Caleb? Well, um, like the second sentence is like, um, it's not really easy to to come by because, um, you know, it can take me, like, we can both just easily get tired of one another, can easily give up of trying to get someone to realize that they're doing the wrong thing, and so we, we can easily just get tired of it, and so it's not really easy to go by. So. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I think we would say that in an ideal world, um, the, the second half there would be easy, right? It, it should be easy for us to love people. It should be easy for us, therefore, to, to be firm and patient with 
sinners. So of course that'd be in an, in an, in an ideal world. But if we were in an ideal world, we would never ever have to carry out church discipline because no one would sin. Um, not an easy thing to do, to, to say the least. Um, and really, Paul has talked about a lot of things in this letter that aren't easy to do. They aren't easy subjects to grapple on and think about. He talks about some deep and, and weighty stuff here. So I think he closes out his letter in a very appropriate manner. Let's take a look at his benediction there, 16 to 18. Who wants them? Who wants those verses? Great stuff. Go ahead, Denise. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you, all of you. I, Paul, write this reading in my own hand, which is this, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right. So he's got a nice benediction there. And, you know, the first time when I read this, it, it kind of sounded to me like Paul said the same thing three different times. But I don't think that's the case. I think he's got a different point to get across, a different message of hope and encouragement for us with each element in that benediction. So let's break it down a little bit. Consider each point. Explain it. What is Paul saying? So, so consider the first one there. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. What is Paul saying there? Okay, don't stress out. Why not? Well, because God is peace, right? And he's asking, uh, or blessing him, we, we could say, you know, the God of peace is, is going to give you peace. And not only is he going to give you peace, look at how he ends there. Everywhere you go, no matter what you're doing, you know, at all times and in every way, may God do this for you. How about the next one? There, the Lord be with all of you. That he can he's always with us and that he can always like that he always like looks out for us. Yeah, what a what a great uh, word of comfort and encouragement there, right? May God never depart from you. Again, building off of the last thought, kind of wherever you go, whatever you do, may God always be there with you. And the last point there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We've got a different word here used. He says the grace. Yeah, the, exactly. Um, you know, what, what is grace? Well, it's, it's forgiveness, right? It's giving us things we don't deserve. What better example of grace is there than that forgiveness? I mean, you know, may, may the grace that Jesus fully and freely gives to all be with you everywhere. Now, considering the things that Paul has talked about in this benediction, or in this letter, why is this a fitting close? Why is this a fitting benediction? Because it's all true. Because it's all true, for sure. Any other thoughts? Yeah, maybe just to build off of what you said, Caleb, you know, it's, it's all true. It's all going to happen. God's going to do all of this stuff. Um, remember that as you, we make our dealings with sinning sinful brothers and sisters remember that as we contend with and fight with anti-christian forces in our world uh remember that you know that that the, these forces aren't going to win they are going to be judged and god is going to do everything for you that paul laid out in his benediction one last thought for us to consider here so i think that sometimes the blessings and the benedictions you know say you're reading through one of these epistles one of these letters. And you get to the last couple of verses or so, and you're like, all right, good, I'm done with this letter. And, you know, if you're, you're anything like me, the benedictions are just kind of thoughts to sound nice when, when you're closing out a letter. But you read through these things, and there's just a ton of good, awesome, and encouraging stuff in these benedictions. And they are all worth careful and persistent study. And, of course, there's a lot of reasons why. So, so think of some of those reasons. Uh, list several reasons, several situations in your life in which recalling a, a benediction, like the one we just looked at there, would be beneficial. Caleb? Like if, um, 
they're going through a really like low time uh like you know like uh if you're going through like if you have depression you're always sad and you feel like you know you're you're worthless and stuff and if you look at that like, you know the lord's always there yeah and will always like take care of you yeah you you may think all these negative things about yourself but uh but it's not true i mean look at look at uh, the the words that Paul has got to say over you, to say to you, to apply to you. Good. Others. I, I think with like this last one, with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, it, it kind of brings it full circle, especially in this context, because he's talking about you have this mm -hmm. issue of laziness, you're trying to correct it, and once it's been corrected, you forgive it and move on. You know, yeah. You don't you don't bring it up ten years ago. Remember when you were lazy. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. You know, this this grace that Paul proclaims over us, it's not just for us, it's it's for all sinners out there. Um, offer that you know, a, a sanctification point here for sure. Other thoughts. I know for me I'm getting ready to start the hardest semester of nursing school and I've been extremely stressed about it. So coming back and knowing, you know, God has a plan, no matter what happens, I'm going to end up where I'm supposed to just be calm about it. Yeah. Has helped me immensely. Yeah, you know, how's how's that for a thought too, right? Um, we worry about things, we get stressed about things, um, understandably so, but God is in control. God's going to have us where he's going to have us. And, and no matter where he has us, he is going to bless us. He is going to keep us. He is going to be gracious to us. That's a great thought to go, uh, to go forward on. Anything else you'd like to say here? Or any questions or comments? Well, why don't we close then? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.